<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Eve Stern, Director of the Center for the Humanities, and I want to welcome everyone who's here in the room, and I know we have quite a few people joining us on the live stream, so welcome to them too. I'm so delighted to welcome Dr. Akia Dabaros Gomes and Dr. Jason Mancini to URI to present a panel telling stories about the ocean. This event is the second in our year-long series on innovations in storytelling. And Dr. Amelia Moore from URI's Marine Affairs Department is going to introduce our panelists. But first, I would like to welcome Wanda Hopkins, who is both the URI Enrollment Services representative and a member of the Narragansett tribe, who has very kindly agreed to step up at the very last minute to say a few words and substitute for Lorenz Spears from the Tomaquag Museum, who has been delayed getting here from an event in Boston. So welcome, Wanda Hopkins. Asko Wakwasin, hello. Welcome to the land of the Narragansett. When you come to URI, take a moment to look around and imagine the land as it was when our ancestors, when my ancestors were here. And how important this land is still to our tribe. So it's not just in form and fashion that we recognize or do a land acknowledgement. It's important to acknowledge that the people are of this land and we belong here and we are still here and we welcome all of you today. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I am Dr. Amelia Moore, Associate Professor and Cultural Anthropologist in the Department of Marine Affairs. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce our panelists for today. I've had the privilege of working with both of them on presentations and panels and on ongoing projects. And I'm so glad that you too will now get to know more about their work if you don't know them already. Akia de Barros Gomes received her PhD in anthropology with a focus in archaeology from the University of Connecticut. She worked as a college professor before shifting to museum curation. She's now the senior curator of maritime social histories at Mystic Seaport Museum. De Barros Gomes is responsible for working on curatorial projects of race, indigeneity, ethnicity, and diversity in the maritime cultures of New England. She's about to open a major exhibition this fall featuring the complex historical framework of New England's maritime history with narratives of visual and material culture, archeology, span oral traditions, songs, and performances. And we'll help spread the word about that as far and wide as we possibly can when it's ready to share. I'm very excited about that because this will be an ex exhibition that you cannot miss. Jason Mancini is the executive director of Connecticut Humanities, where he works towards strengthening and integrating organizational partnerships and diverse audiences with placemaking, public history and integrative digital initiatives. Mancini also has a PhD in anthropology, which is a good club to be in, or depending, uh, with a focus on the archeology span and ethnohistory of New England from the University of Connecticut. He also co-founded the Aqu Aquama Educational Initiative and he's the former executive director of the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center, also in Connecticut. And then I would like to mention also, of course, associate professor, Martha Elena Rojas in the English department, um, who studies early American literature and culture with an emphasis on the literature of politics and personal narrative in the colonial and early national periods. So I'll turn it over to our panel. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Just want to make sure I always have trouble with these things. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about ocean stories, um, our spirituality, our histories, and our communities. And I will tell you up front, I'm struggling with the we and our 
Um, as a social historian, as an anthropologist, as a museum curator, that is also a person of color. I sometimes forget when I'm saying we and our, when I mean we and our as a person of color, as a person of African descent, and when I'm saying we and our as a scholar. And so if I slip up there, please let me know and I'll, I'll clarify. But what I really wanted to talk about is a project that I'm currently working on uh, with Jason and the perspective of that project and why it's so important that we're doing the work we're doing. Do not read this. <laughs> um, I just want to highlight that, you know, when we talk about telling Black and Indigenous stories and Black and Indigenous histories and talking about Black and Indigenous knowledge and science, um, these are histories, stories, sciences that have been dismissed, appropriated, stolen, used for profit, and the communities haven't benefited. Right, and so it's very important for me as a scholar, um, it's very important for me as a woman of African descent, that my work is grounded in making sure that stories are told from the perspective of the community, right? How would the ancestors want these stories to be told? And we have a responsibility to tell them in that way, which of course doesn't always align with what a museum wants to do or what a university wants to do. And so one of the first conversations I had with community members when engaging in this project is how do we tell these stories? How do we engage um, the community in this story? How do we validate histories, sciences, myths that don't necessarily align with Western thought and science? And so after a first conversation with the exhibition community, which Jason is on and Lorenz Spears is on. Um, and I will say, I, uh, Jason probably hates when I say this, right? Other than Jason, everyone else on the committee is Black or Indigenous, right? <laughs> um, but how do we want these stories told? And so this might be difficult to see up there, but I highlighted the things that are most important, at least to me. Um, and so I'll read a little bit of it. The first two words, Kuta and Kalunga, are Pequot and African words for the ocean. So one of the things we wanna be really careful about in our storytelling is language, because language creates a mode of thought. And if you're translating into English, sometimes you're not translating appropriately. So for example, and I'll show an image of this, that word Kalunga, it doesn't just mean ocean. There are spiritual connotations, there are ancestral connotations. So using the word ocean doesn't capture that. Saying Atlantic Ocean doesn't capture that. So Kuta Kalunga and its tributaries connect the histories, cultures, peoples, and legacies of African societies and kingdoms to the sovereign indigenous nations of Turtle Island, right? Not North America. And what we're saying in that first sentence is the story we are telling, our maritime history of New England, our black and indigenous maritime history of New England, isn't a story of slavery and colonialism. That might be the context but our story is Africans encountering indigenous folks here, right? That's the narrative we're telling. But importantly, there's a focus on ancestors, the circularity of time, so no timelines, right? Circularity of time and fundamental circles of birth, death, and rebirth. So there's no linear time, time is a cycle, every death is a rebirth, every birth is a death, right? Um, of something that, that preceded it. And then finally, we're celebrating and acknowledging the enduring legacy, strength, and resilience of sovereign indigenous nations and African descended peoples of the Dawnland. And so this is the story we want to tell. And what I'm going to do for my part, um, I am most comfortable, although I'm working with indigenous communities on this storytelling, for my presentation, I'm gonna focus on African and African descended stories because those are my stories to tell. Indigenous stories are not my stories to tell or interpret. So I'm going to start with, um, you know, ocean water stories, the story of Evil Landing. How many people are familiar with that story? <laughs> okay. So I actually, I just came back, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, um, from Charleston, South Carolina to visit the new International African American Museum. And there's this amazing 
the whole museum is amazing, but there's this amazing exhibit on Gullah Geechee culture, um, specifically in the South Carolina Sea Islands. And there's a story from those islands of a place called Ebo Landing. The historical account of what happened at Ebo Landing is enslaved people, men, women, and children, got off the slave ship and collectively decided to commit suicide. They got off the ship and they walked right into the water and drowned. That's the historical accounting of what happened. The African accounting of what happened and the Gullah Geechee accounting of what happened is that the Africans decided to fly home. It was not a mass suicide, they decided to fly home. And so how do we validate that story? How do we tell that story in a way that museum visitors or scholars or the general public doesn't leave with, well, there's an African myth that people flew home, but it was really a mass suicide, right? And just to, to give you a sense of the persistence and the weight and the importance of this story, films have been made about this story. Novels have been written about this story. And when I was teaching, I would always highlight that image in the middle. Beyonce made a video about this story, right? So you know what's important in American culture. And according to the Ebo, the water brought me here, so the water will bring me back. So I want to talk about ocean stories that, that involve that concept of the water returning us home, bringing us back. This image is a Bakongo cosmogram, which there could be an entire semester course on this cosmogram, but I'm going to be pretty general and, and quick. Um, so you see the cross in the middle. That horizontal line is Kalunga. That is literally the water. The circle with the arrows is, I was gonna reduce it to movement of time, but it's movement of so much more than that, right? This is space and time in this image. And this is a sub-Saharan African concept of how the universe works, right? It's a cosmology. And so if you look at, um, I don't know what happened and my mic is off. So I don't know if the power died. That's very weird. Maybe I'm not supposed to be sharing that. <laughs> Well, if you can imagine that picture in your head, and we can go over it again when things come back up. There we go. So that circle on the right, that small circle on the right, think of that as sunrise. So the sun comes up over the water, right? It hits its peak at noon, and then the sun sets in that circle on the left of the horizontal line. But then the sun goes out of our sight. We know it's still there. We know it's going to come back, but we can't see it, right? So this image is about, yeah. I don't think this is working. Hmm? It is up. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's always a tech issue, right? No matter how much you so the sun goes out of our sight and we can't see it. This is about the movement of time, right? The movement of the sun. This is also about our life cycle, right? We're born, we live, we die, and then we go. And even though you can't see us, we're still here, right? We're ancestors. And time, this is about the movement of our lives. This is about the movement of the sun. This is the entire framework of the universe. And that line between what we would consider the living and the dead is water, right? So very spiritually significant. And all of those stories about water are then spiritually significant. In thinking about these stories and how they've been transmitted, um, I know when I was in grad school, the big thing was Africanisms, 
right? So if, if you were doing an archaeology or anthropology or historical project, your goal was to figure out what things were maintained intact from the African continent and brought here. But that's a really simplistic way of looking at things, right? And so my focus, my study, when I read these stories, when I learn about these stories, when I speak to West African colleagues, my mind is on creative adaptation, right? Because Africanism assumes that there's this thing called authenticity, which only occurs when things don't change over time. But if you think about Africans, African descended peoples, indigenous peoples, for thousands and thousands of years, we've survived because of creative adaptation. So looking toward that, we can start to think beyond, oh, my mic's on. <laughs> we can start to think beyond Africanisms and authenticity and really focus on these stories and artifacts and belongings as examples of creative adaptation. And so I have an example of it here. Um, if you look to the right, that is what is known as a Congolese and Kisi, right? Which, which very simply can be translated to sacred medicine. And so this is a figure that could be used in prayer. This is a figure that can be used to ask for protection. Um, in the African worldview, there's a single creator, but that creator is very busy, too busy to deal with us and our problems. And so the, if you think of a triangle, the creator's on the top of that triangle. That creator was kind enough to give us ancestors and intermediaries, right, to speak on our behalves. So that's who we speak to when we are in prayer, when we're asking for forgiveness or protection. Um, and so these in Kissy are, are used to speak to those intermediaries, whether they're ancestors or divinities. And so if you look at the Nkisi, um, there is a cowrie shell in the middle of the forehead. There's hair sticking out from the shoulder. There's some cloth, like a little cloth skirt. There are nails. There are components that are like glass and animal bone. Um, so this is Congolese, right? But lo and behold, under a floorboard in Newport, Rhode Island, um, what you see on the left was discovered. So it's an Nkisi bundle, which has in it a cowrie shell, right? How did a cowrie shell get to Newport from West Africa? That's a whole mystery. Bones, glass, pins, metal, all of the elements you see in the Nkisi sculpture, you're seeing in that bundle. So that's what I mean when I talk about creative adaptation, right? Taking those concepts, taking that foundation and building on it. Interesting enough, right? The nails, and, and there's been a debate um, whether we should call the bundle a spirit bundle or a kissy bundle. And I keep arguing we should call it a kissy bundle because of the nails. Because if you look at an kissy sculpture, the thing that activates your prayer or breathes life into your prayer is hitting it with a nail. And so the fact that pins were in that bundle, I think is pretty significant. It can also help us to think about conversion to Christianity and what that would have actually meant in the African or African descended mind. So where did these water stories, right? The stories of our creation, the stories of resurrection in the water, the story of birth, life, death, and rebirth, where did those water stories go if enslaved individuals were converted to Christianity? If you look at that in Kissy again, a lot of the elements you see in an Kissy, you see in the symbol of Jesus on the cross. If you think about the cosmogram, right, a cross would not have been a new symbol for someone of African descent. A cross being represented and representative of resurrection would not have been new for a person of African descent. And the idea of Jesus being nailed to a cross to secure your resurrection for an African could mean that's a pretty powerful kissy. And in fact, in West Africa now and throughout the Caribbean and South and Central America and practices like Santeria and Vodun, Christ is invoked, right? Because he's a powerful and kissy, he was nailed to the cross. And that's what breathes life into our resurrection. And so I, I mention this again, I don't have any evidence of this, but I think these are questions we should be asking, right? That haven't necessarily been asked before. 
Other water stories, very, very important for Africans and people of African descent, stories of divinities like Mamiwata, who, you know, there are stories of Mamiwata saving the souls of individuals who were thrown overboard on slave ships. There are stories of Mamiwata invoking vengeance on slave takers, right? Where did all of those stories go once people were here, once people were in the Caribbean? If you think about Mamiwata and that her colors are blue and white and that she's the mother of us all and that she's the mother of creation, you can guess that someone of African descent might see that image in Mary. Another thing I, I should mention here um, when we're talking about these stories is within traditional African spirituality, which is very inclusive, right? Because the thinking is there are things that we are always going to have to learn. We will never know everything. So if something comes along that makes sense, it's accepted. And so throughout West Africa, you will hear people praying to Mary and Jesus because it makes sense, right? It's a story that can be included. And I'll add before I go to the next slide, the name Mary literally means water, ocean, right? So again, when you're thinking of things like conversion to Christianity, these things would have clicked. They would have made sense. And when you speak to people throughout Africa and the Caribbean now, you hear things like, well, of course, Mary would have appeared this way to Europeans. She can manifest herself any way she wants, right? And so those stories, even though we may have forgotten now in New England, the origin of those stories, the importance of those stories, they were probably transmitted. And here's my favorite, right? If we think about now, where did those water stories go? Those stories of Mamiwata, who is a mermaid, those stories of water and spirituality. If you look to things like Afrofuturism, right, novels, fiction, science fiction, still many, many stories about Mamiwata, many stories about mermaids, the film Daughters of the Dust, which captures that story of Ebo landing. Um, and then, you know, Jimi Hendrix, you look at his lyrics, he talks about escaping this world of war and trouble by becoming a merman and returning to the sea. That's African spirituality. I'm gonna skip that because I've been talking way too long and Jason needs to get up here. Um, and so one way that we are telling these stories, exploring these stories, inviting community members and descendants to share these stories is through our project. One thing we recently completed is a collaborative dugout canoe building where we had two individuals that were from West Africa that are boat builders and an individual from Mashpee Wampanoag and another that was Mashantucket Pequot work together to collaboratively build a canoe. One of the interesting things that we found in exploring these stories is that many of them, though the stories are different, there is a very similar worldview. Um, same thing with this canoe building. It's done in almost exactly the same way throughout Africa and here in the Dawnland. That'll be in the exhibit. And then when we think about ocean stories, it's important to always keep in mind the duality of the sea. So when we're talking about the sea as representative of birth and death and rebirth, the sea is representative of ebb and flow. The sea is representative of trauma and healing. There's always been this duality. And so I have a quote on the bottom that's pretty impossible to see, but it says, there is history, culture, tragedy, and defiance too. There is beauty through ugliness and because of it, hope. So our stories of slavery, our stories of dispossession, our stories of violence always contain an element of rebirth and survival. And so I'm just gonna end on this image, which will also be a part of our exhibit. But one of the goals of this project through our storytelling and, and telling stories, um, Black and Indigenous maritime stories, is to put together fragmented cultures, right? So the goal of colonization has always been to fragment, to enslave, to, um, to tear apart communities. And really, you know, for me, a project like ours is about trying to defragment, if that's a word, and put those stories back together. 
And as you can see from this, this vessel here, some pieces have been ground into dust, some pieces are lost and might never be found, but the work of storytelling and reconnecting is how we begin to put those pieces back together. And one of the things about putting those pieces back together, um, some would argue this is more beautiful than the original form because the original form was taken for granted and a lot of love and care has to go into putting those stories back together. Thank you. I love hearing the Kia speak. Um, always enlightening um, and it's always a delight to work with her on the many projects over the last 20, 21 years. Um, I'm going to make sure I'm going in the right direction here. <laughs> Um, so the, usually this is a presentation that I'll give in the course of an hour. I'm going to style it as a Pecha Kucha version, so um, it's going to be quick. Um, so just to position myself a little bit here, um, I'm not a Native person. Um, I work closely with Native people. Uh, I grew up on stolen reservation land in uh, Ledger, Connecticut, which is uh, homelands of the Mashantuck and Pequot community. Uh, so the first four years of my life were spent on former overseers, uh, you know, former overseers' home. Um, and so growing up in the town of Ledger, Connecticut, and going to school with Pequot uh, children uh, had alerted me um, to what was and wasn't known about the Pequot community uh, that I was growing up with. Um, and really, I can frame this around two bookends, one being the Pequot massacre that took place in 1637, uh, and the other uh, being the Foxwoods Casino, which was uh, created in 1992. So those bookends um, are what the broader public really understands as indigenous history uh, and cultural connections in southern New England. And as I, as I began my graduate work and, and the work um, over the course of 25, 30 years at the Mashantucket Pequot Museum, uh, it became clear that there was an enormous gap in public knowledge and public history uh, that needed to be filled. So my scholarship is really focused on that. What I'm going to share with you here is a piece of that. And so thinking about the indigenous homelands of this region, you can see uh, overlapping and intersecting indigenous spaces um, as we look at this area that we now call Southern New England. Um, and for the point of this presentation, uh, I'll note that what you're seeing here is roughly 10 million acres of land, uh, and those are all indigenous homelands uh, before the arrival of Europeans. By the era of the American Revolution, those homelands evaporated to about 30,000 acres collectively among all indigenous people in this uh, image. So really beginning to understand the impact of dispossession, uh, the process of erasure and extraction uh, of Native people, and then the, the process of resisting that and adapting to that uh, becomes really important. And one of the things I do want to point out here, I always like to include Long Island um, in this image because of the close historical and cultural ties among and between Indigenous communities uh, in mainland Southern New England. Really reframing this, uh, thinking about water as a connector and not a divider. Um, and, and really going into a lot of what um, Akia's and our, our, the exhibit work that we're doing at Mystic uh, is really about is, is the, the confluence of waterways and the connection of people across space and time. So thinking about this land and the impact um, of colonization um, on it, uh, I just want to highlight a couple of things. First is um, the environmental devastation that, that reshaped uh, southern New England. Um, which is depicted in the image in the upper left, looking at the ways in which um, what were formerly forests and fields um, are being carved, uh, divided, allotted uh, separately and owned individually um, to the exclusion of others. This was, this was against indigenous traditions and ways of thinking about land tenure. Um, so I'm just, I'm just going to put some pins in these and we may come back to them or you may have questions about them. But I also want to talk a little bit about um, the impact of warfare on indigenous communities. Um, so following the Pequot War, King Philip's War um, in the 1670s, and then a barrage of colonial era wars uh, among the French 
uh, the English and indigenous allies on both sides, which would be uh, King William's War, Queen Anne's War, King George's War, the French and Indian War, the American Revolution. Over the course of the late 17th and throughout the 18th centuries, had a devastating impact on the indigenous men who fought in those uh, conflicts, leaving a disproportionate number of women um, uh, to, to really care for community in the process of land dispossession um, and the, the diminishing resources uh, in their traditional homelands like deer, turkey, and so on. So subsistence practices really began to transform rapidly. <clears throat> Couple all of this with the enslavement of Africans um, that are forcibly brought to the shores of New England and end up um, in New England's households and on uh, plantation style farms uh, that begin uh, to, to, to bring together socially and sexually people from four continents for the first time in human history. And the consequences of that become really important in terms of how power is structured within this increasingly racialized society. So jumping ahead a little bit here to um, the process of resisting uh, some of those new structures of, of power that are being assembled through colonial uh, constructs, uh, these resistance um, movements uh, that are uh, depicted in various ways through newspaper accounts. I, I've, I borrowed this title from a, a publication actually from Rhode Island on um, newspaper extracts called Runaways, Deserters, and Notorious Villains. Really the different ways that indigenous people and broadly people of color are removing themselves uh, willfully from bad situations, whether enslavement, indenture, uh, military service, whatever they want to get away from. Um, they're running away from it. They're deserting service. Uh, notorious villains is a reference to piracy, um, which is also an act of empowering themselves. Um, but in these situations, what is happening is um, the, the, the masters in these scenarios are pr providing descriptions of individuals and providing a warning to masters of, be, of vessels be warned not to harbor or conceal these individuals. So through hundreds and hundreds of these advertisements, it becomes clear that when given the opportunity to abandon service, these people are going to ports, they're getting on vessels and they're going to sea. So the sheer number of indigenous men going to sea begins to affect the way the populations on land are being perceived. <clears throat> to the point at which uh, white overseers who, who are charged with the management of the affairs of tribes in the late 18th and early 19th centuries are going to the reservations and they're making comments such as, uh, all of the able and smart men are gone. There are only women, old, old women and crippled men here uh, at Mohegan, the young men go to sea and die. Um, in various ways, this is overly fatalistic. Um, yes, maritime labor is incredibly dangerous, um, but what uh, deeper exploration does is reveal um, how almost completely uh, the diverse histories and experience of indigenous men, men of color, are in this maritime context. And just to give you a couple of examples, um, the federal government in 1796 mandated uh, the customs districts in each port of commerce to create, uh, create a register of seamen and issue seamen's protection certificates which are essentially passports. And those registers, one such register is transcribed here. And you can begin to see the different labels ascribed to these men. Um, it's just really a constellation of labels that emerges during this time. And once we can move through this, and, and I'll say out of 6,000, this is the Customs District of New London, out of 6,000 entries, about 30% of those entries are people of color. So while the population of color on land might be anywhere from 5 to 10 percent, 12 percent on land. It's close to 30 percent at sea. Um, so again, given that opportunity, the population, especially of males, is moving towards the ocean. A deeper dive into this, and I won't get into it, reveals that when you rearrange uh, this, what is a database here, uh, alph not alphabetically, but numerically, according to the protection certificate numbers, uh, we see groups of men, what I call ethno fraternities, emerging in these ports. So men are going together, they're being issued certificates, and then they're going on vessels together in groups. Uh, and so 
being able to sort of uh, unpack some of that, looking at what's happening and trying to reveal a deeper narrative of more than just they're getting on a vessel and they're going to sea and they're getting paid for it and then they come home, we start to see our patterns, patterns of behavior, patterns of ocean movement, uh, patterns of resistance and so on. In order to do that, um, we've, uh, my staff and I have looked at um, uh, the, the mobility patterns through uh, crew lists. So also collected in these ports of commerce, every crew had to be registered on this particular image. I don't know if this thing has a laser pointer. I'm not going to even try it. But some of the highlights there point out uh, there are three Mashantucket Pequot Mariners and one Mohegan on this particular voyage of the ship Connecticut to the South Atlantic Ocean whaling. <clears throat> so that's great. They're on a voyage together. Um, but South Atlantic Ocean is a pretty vast space. Um, what what we're able to do then is connect an actual logbook um, that was recovered from the New London County Historical Society and use the latitude and longitude every day that was recorded in that to create global positioning. Um, and you can also see here that the, um, the whale that was captured um, and um, um, extracted uh, and so on. I don't even 90 barrels of oil. Um, anyway, so having latitude and longitude then gives us global positioning, and we can start to map this out and see exactly where they're going, but also that they're not alone. They're on voyages, with they're, they're on vessels going into ocean spaces with dozens and dozens of other whale ships, and they're seeing their cousins, their friends, people from other communities, and they're going to ports around the world as well. Um, the stories that I could share about voyages to Hawaii, to Alaska, to New Zealand, um, and people leaving those whale ships and staying in those places, um, as well as people from those places coming here to the region's ports. Those of you who might be familiar with Herman Melville's description of the street um, and all of the diverse uh, languages and people on the street. That might be in London, Mystic, Stonington, Providence, Bedford, and so on. Um, so beginning to sort of dig deeper into these narratives through belongings um, and through photographs um, and, and objects uh, are also really important. So working with tribal communities and the relationship that I've built um, over time, over the course of 35 plus years working with tribal communities across the region um, has, has allowed us collectively to reanimate these stories and bring the ancestors' uh, stories back to the communities today. So looking at um, whalers like Edwin Fowler, um, who said all true Mohegans are whalers at heart, and then seeing an image of him with his aunt on Mohegan Hill and the sperm whale teeth that are in the Tantaquitian Indian Museum all come together and begin to, to, to say something new and contextualize the other objects that are in the Tantaquitian Museum and also um, other museums with similar types of stories. Um, I think about the sovereignty um, of the Mashpee Wampanoag community and the fights that they had um, in the 1830s for self-governance um, and the civil rights initiatives that they undertook um, during that time, um, what was uh, uh, called the Mashpee Revolt, um, or according to the autobiographer, uh, Pequot uh, minister named William Apes, uh, the pretend Indian riot um, that took place at Mashpee um, in 1834 over the protection of their own timber resources. A number of people were imprisoned um, and put on trial uh, for protecting and overturning uh, a white thieves cart uh, that was taking uh, timber away from the reservation. In response to that, they were uh, granted uh, self-governance, but me almost immediately after that, they went and built their own sloop um, that they called the Native of Marshby, where they harvested their own timber and sold it to the island of Nantucket, uh, which was completely deforested at the time, uh, with ownership uh, of the vessel being maintained by Mashpee um, and the, their own uh, resources being used to their benefit. Uh, this is an image of a rail in the upper portion of the Mashpee's church uh, that William Apes preached at. And you can see etched into that rail a number of, uh, a couple of uh, sloops and a schooner uh, 
Uh, no doubt one of these was the native, uh, the son of Marshmi. Um, and that's a story that, um, that the tribe had long since forgot, but being able to return that story to the tribal community, that they can connect the dots of their fight for sovereignty um, over many, many years, centuries, uh, becomes really important. And I'll just finish with this um, current project that I've been working on. I found in, in order to sort of work on um, telling the story um, uh, of native mariners, I've been looking for ways of animating uh, through their own voices. Um, and I found this account, uh, um, this newspaper account of an old manuscript that tells the story of a, uh, Charles Lansing, a pirate of Narragansett descent. Um, it was found on a Kansas farm in 1920, I'm sorry, 1931, um, and talks about a manuscript that remained unpublished. Uh, so I had called every historical society in Kansas trying to look for this um, and was unsuccessful for probably 10 years until I gave a presentation in New London. And a Mohegan elder friend of mine came up to me afterwards and asked if, if I'd ever heard of a book called The Narragansett Chief. And I had. Um, and when I read it, I went home on, on Google Books and pulled it up, and it was identical to the newspaper article that said it was unpublished. So, in fact, it is published. Um, unfortunately, it's, unpu it's, it's anonymously published. So until now, nobody's made the connection between Charles Lansing and the anonymous uh, author of the Narragansett Chief. Um, complicating that as well is for 190 years, it's been labeled as a work of fiction. Um, so I've gone through this book, combed through it, uh, and have since been validating the narrative of the Narragansett Chief um, uh, through archival search. And it now becomes uh, the second uh, known autobiography uh, of a Native person of Narragansett descent in one of the earliest abolitionist narratives. Uh, so working on uh, a book project with that, an essay for IKEA uh, through Mystic Seaport. So I think I'm done. Uh, for more information, um, Mystic Seaport has um, uh, one of my projects that I did about 10 years ago called Connecticut Indian Mariners, um, and the website's there. I also have done a lot of small essays on IndianMarinersProject.com, so check it out. Um, you'll see lots of cool stories there as well. So, that's it. Thank you. Does that work? Yes. My role today is to facilitate conversation between our panelists and later between you, our audience, and ourselves. Um, I'm Marty Rojas. I'm an associate professor in English. And um, I guess my biggest connection to this panel is that every, almost every year I teach a seminar on literature at the sea, um, in which both of your works have um, appeared throughout the years. Thank you. I have been thinking about this panel and today's event as a continuation of um, another event last spring at the Graduate School of Oceanography called Oceans, Oceans Tell, Tell Stories Through People. And that foregrounded a series of interconnected narratives that centered the identities, histories, and cultures of scholars and knowledge holders, um, including Professor Amelia Moore, um, and their re own relationship to the oceans and the waterways in which their lives are immersed. And I wondered if for a moment I could take both of you perhaps away from your presentations and ask you um, what your relationship to the ocean or the water is or was or has become. Well, um, I, I've lived in uh, coastal southern New England my whole life. Um, I, I was sort of born an archaeologist and figured I'd be spending my life digging holes. Um, and, you know, honestly, before the, this project, I never imagined a deeper connection to, um, to the ocean. Um, I always loved being on uh, or under the water. Um, 
but um, I think I have to, I can't not connect it to this project, I think, because um, uh, the relationships that I've established for myself vis-a-vis -vis this project have meant so much more um, in the different ways that um, I've, I've been compelled to pursue uh, these stories across the world, um, having found um, connections in New Zealand and in Hawaii and in Alaska. Um, and some of my native friends call me a people weaver. Um, and so looking at the different ways that these stories are woven um, through, in some cases, my recovery of historical records, um, but bringing people back together across space and time. So when uh, Maoris in New Zealand reach out to say, we have a, a, a native uh, New England uh, Indian uh, ancestor who's, who's an, uh, one of our ancestors, we don't know how to make this connection. Um, you know, to be able to, um, to travel and, and build that and build those uh, ocean connections become really important. So in, in many ways, the intersection of my connection to the sea, their connection to the sea has become my connection to the sea. When the ocean going canoe Hokulea from, from Hawaii uh, came to the coastal waters of New England, um, it's only reinforced my uh, connection to the communities that are, are part of this global story um, of reconnection. So I, I probably went off topic a little bit there, but you know, I think for me is, you know, what I wasn't able to relate earlier is, you know, I'm not a native person, I'm an ally and I have a deep sense of justice um, in bringing uh, these untold stories, uh, returning them, rematriating them to their communities. And for me, water is that connector. Um, so. And I'll say for my part, I'm not going to say too much because I'll let you know that part of our project is a publication where um, community members were invited to talk about their experiences. So Black and Indigenous community members could write a narrative, could contribute art to talk about their Dawnland or New England experience. And I started writing and my chapter was going to be about this project. And it somehow turned into this way too personal narrative about my relationship with the ocean and water to the extent that I sent it. And when I sent it to the person who was editing my chapter, it's like, uh, I probably got a little too personal here. But it, it was really the story of, you know, I'm from Newport, Middletown, Rhode Island. I grew up on the beach. I grew up on the water. Never thought that much about it until I moved away from the water and hated it and had to come back home. Um, and th and I'm, I'm abbreviating because I want you to buy the book and, and read the actual stories. Um, I went through what I describe in my chapter as a reverse seasoning. So if you think about slavery, right, Africans were sent to the Caribbean most often before they came here. Um, I somehow fell into a project in the U.S. Virgin Islands and um, ended up falling in love with a the community there and, and staying there and doing work for a really long time. And then after that, um, ended up working in West Africa. And so instead of going from West Africa to the Caribbean to New England, I went from New England to the Caribbean to West Africa and had a profound experience in both locations that were um, very educational regarding my own connections to the ocean and the water and my ancestry and some pretty direct ancestry um, in both places that I stumbled upon. So I would say, you know, my connection with the water, it was, it was always taken for granted. I mean, literally now where I live, I look out on Narragansett Bay every morning and I'm so grateful for that, that that's how I start my day looking out at the ocean. But it was always something I took for granted um, until I had those experiences in the Caribbean and West Africa. And it's amazing that for both of you, the relationship is created and deepens through your scholarship and your research and your teaching, your writing. Um, I think in, in some ways you've 
both of your presentations have addressed this because we we see the the products of of your work but i i i was wondering if you could talk about the way um your current institutional positions allow you to differently tell the stories that you have um, collected and taken care of um, in your professional lives up until the, the moment where you are a curator at the Mystic Museum or that you are the director of, the, of Connecticut Humanities, which is the state council on the on the humanities so take that in whatever direction you would like uh, well <clears throat> during my time at the pequot museum um you know my responsibility was to the mashantucket pequot tribe tribal communities i was um, working on behalf of so my scholarship was part of um returning the 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 sort of stories of maritime traditions and, and maritime mobility to the public domain through uh, research uh, programs, presentations, exhibits, and so on. Um, I've now uh, moved on from the Pequot Museum, but my relationships um, remain with the tribal communities with whom I, I have worked and continue to work um, and continue to be invited to participate in various projects to share my knowledge and expertise. Um, um, you know, my, my work doesn't exist without them and, um, you know, honored to, to continue to, to be a part of um, their communities in the way they see fit. Um, and my work with Agamal, which emerged sort of in the aftermath of, of leaving the Pequot Museum Agamal was created to re-indigenize public spaces. So with my Native colleagues and, and creating Agamal, um, a lot of organizations were struggling to connect to indigenous communities, to indigenous stories, um, and how to honor um, communities they had no connection to. So our goal was, um, if I can just take a moment, um, Agamal is the Passamaquoddy word for the snowshoe path. Um, and in Passamaquoddy country, the snowshoe path um, after the, the first snows is the hardest path to travel. And once it's laid, every successive uh, passerby, it's easier to travel. So our goal is always to sort of build those bridges, making it easier for others to, to have the connections um, um, in, in working with tribal communities, but also that we could step away from that process and um, those relationships would be established. And, and relationships are really at the center of everything. Um, and teaching people, it's kind of odd to have to teach people to have relationships. Um, but the, the history of relationships with indigenous people has been one largely based around erasure and extraction. Um, so building an awareness um, uh, around that and how to undo that harm um, and build positive relations, relations has been really important to the, the foundational work I was doing at the Pequot Museum and to my board at Connecticut Humanities as we continue to sort of demonstrate right relations with tribal communities um, for other organizations, whether colleges and universities, the National Park Service, the National Endowment for the Humanities, all the other humanities councils look to Connecticut um, and, and our role um, for how to, how to do this right and, and to Agamel quite frankly, for, for doing this right. I'm very happy to be at Mystic Seaport. I will tell you mostly because uh, my previous life, I was a college professor um, in anthropology and I could not do the work I wanted to do at a university because it became clear to me as time went on that I was operating in two different realities, right? I was an anthropologist, but I was also an other. And so that's pretty heavy, right? You're in a discipline that was meant to study and dissect you and rationalize your mode of thought. Um, and it got to the point where, you know, after my, my work in the Virgin Islands, 
I wanted to publish about the community I was working with. And for 10 years, the journal article was returned to me with comments like, this is not anthropology, where's the theory? Um, and in my mind, the theory was the way that the people I lived with saw the world, which I saw as absolutely valid. But when you're an anthropologist, you're told that's, that's something called interpretive drift. That's you as a rational person buying into irrational modes of thought. And so at some point while all of that was going on, I, I gave up the fight and said, I no longer want to be in academics. Um, so I feel like now that split no longer happens, right? I can do a museum exhibit that embraces and validates my own experiences, my own spirituality, my own way of seeing the world without me having to explain it through Marxism or interpretivism or justify it or put it aside so I can get my work done. And I think the relationships are a really important part of that as well. So being able to not replicate that colonizer meets colonized, but really remove myself as a so-called authority and be a facilitator and a contributor on the same level as community members and validating their perspectives and giving them a space to speak about the stories they want to tell and making sure that it's clear that not all stories are for all people and all of that is okay, right? And, and not all museum environments, but, but it's okay in my museum environment. So I think that the work um, is so much better because of that, that dynamic. I, I know I'm supposed to reserve questions for the audience, so I think all of my follow-up points about the incredibly um, provocative things you have said um, for our own place in a university and what can happen within the space and what can't, um, we'll have to wait. So I will turn this over. Am I supposed to? If, if I can maybe just add, mm -hmm. Bridge, what Ikea was saying, I think you know, Mystic Seaport is making a very conscious change. Um, and it hasn't always acted in this way. And, and it's, it's what excites me is that more organizations are, are considering their own institutional humility um, and rethinking how things have been done and putting aside those power structures and reimagining what is possible when others are empowered to do so. And I think IKEA's work at Mystic is transformative in a way um, for a largely, almost exclusively white organization. Um, and these, these spaces, at, you know, colleges and universities still um, resemble in many ways the structures of white power. Um, and being able to confront that, challenge it, and, and reimagine it, I think is really an important step. And that's the work that Agamout is doing, the work that the Seaport is doing, um, is it gives me a lot of hope for what's what's possible um, in our future. And it seems like this is a moment because some of some of what you you say, I've I've also seen that in Salem, at the museums there, and at the Whaling Museum, um, and I am deeply familiar with Mystic Museum before before your arrival. Um, so it is incredibly exciting to see this response. Um, at cultural institutions and hopefully at colleges and universities as, as well. So thank you for your long parts in um, bringing about this kind of opening. We're going to open it up to questions from the audience. That's better. Do we have any questions? Hi, um, I have a question about the idea of ethical engagement from the place of museums. I mean, you were talking about extractive practices and the historical violences of collections, etc. And it seems to me this language and practice and methodologies and modal modalities are not enough. Like ethics can't do enough to engage, to do, to etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the idea of 
transmission of knowledge is in this colonial way. It's still colonial, right? These constructions are still colonial. So I want you to try to give us some language, um, some language, it's a book, but I wanna hear you talk about how these things are antithetical. There's still, there's still tension and friction there. So how do you deal with the fact that these things are not, they are never, they shouldn't be bedfellows, right? So I just want you to talk about how you work through that, through the lens of ethics, especially in anthropology. Anthropology hasn't changed, right? Not that much. Um, even when we're, you know, infusing subjectivity and identity into it, it's still anthropology. So can you give us some thoughts about how you approach this through an ethical practice? I'll try. It might not be an answer that makes you happy, but I'll, I'll give you the way that, that I feel about it. And I can actually relate it to that cosmogram, right? It's a process, not a project, and we will never finish it. Um, museums are colonial institutions, period. And so when I hear things like we've got to decolonize museums, that's a process but you will never decolonize a museum because it's a colonial structure and it's built on a colonial framework and it's built on, let me show off these things that we've collected and we own that are ours and let's tell the stories about them. So I think, you know, and again, this, this might be a cop-out, but this is the way that I, I personally feel about it, Kendall. Um, you can move away from, it's a good thing to move away from dystopia even if you never get to utopia, right? It's a good thing to move away from colonization, even if you never get to decolonization. And there's a lot that you learn along the way in doing that work. And so I feel like I'm a part of the process of learning those things as you're attempting to do something you will never accomplish doing, but that's okay, if that makes sense. I don't know if you feel differently, Jason. No, I, you know, <laughs> Maybe just a, sh a brief anecdote to illustrate one of the areas that I, I'm, I've had some conversations that give me, um, I guess I'm in a hopeful mood right now. Um, my, my answer didn't seem hopeful, but it is. I it feel is, it hopeful. Is, okay. is. Um, I, I was recently interviewed by um, uh, Hearst Media um, in response to um, the NAGPRA um, mandates that after 20 something years, actually 30 years, sorry, um, uh, many human remains remain in museum institutions. Um, and there's a lot of criticism of, of museum, um, uh, various museums around the country um, that retain human remains, funerary objects, objects of cultural patrimony. Um, and after that, I received a number of emails from museums, one in particular in Connecticut, that was really sort of confronting a long-standing um, issue around uh, repatriation requests from a tribe um, that involved an object of cultural patrimony. And, you know, in the past, for 30 years, museum directors have basically said, it's not subject to NAGPRA, you know, all the way, all along doing everything they could to put up a roadblock to prevent the return of what was clearly an object that belonged to a particular tribe. It was a well-documented object. Um, and after this all came out, I was asked to sort of review the documents, look through it, and make a, make a suggestion, a recommendation to the organization around what should they do with it. And my response was, take NAGPRA out of it. What's the right thing to do? You know it's theirs. You want a relationship with this community. Give it back. And they're entertaining that. Really, just imagine that. If, if all of these objects that have been put under lock and key, that have been separated from their communities, that to many tribal communities, these are living things that need to be fed and cared for, um, that their communities have lost contact with, don't even know that they exist because they've been taken or stolen or 
disconnected in whatever way, but to find those reconnections and for museums to sort of rethink that power and return something to a community. They were taken to, to sort of objectify the other and now those communities can be seen as being, they, they can take care of their own material belongings. What about that? What, what, what does that reframing do? I think that is a sea change in the way we, we think about that. Um, so just, just a quick anecdote. I can't get into the specifics because it's still in process, but it, it's, it's exciting to think about um, and I've seen this a number of, in a number of cases where community museums are trying to find these relationships with tribes. And if they want relationships with tribes, this is what it will take. Yeah, and I'll add to that one of the things that we are doing, um, and again, it's probably work that will never completely be done, um, really revisiting our collections and looking at what we have and trying to, as much as possible, locate source communities um, you know, so that we can have, we can, we can reach out to the source communities first and foremost and say, is this something we should have in our collection? And if not, how do we go about starting the process of return? If it is something that we are trusted to preserve and conserve, help us define it better because I'm sure we're, our description is not accurate, right? But doing that you know, again, taking that out of it and saying, how can I be proactive and respect the hands of the makers of these belongings, respect the communities that these belongings belong to, um, I think is something pretty novel in, in museum communities, in museums. Other questions? I actually have one of my own I'll jump in with. Um, we have quite a few students at URI who are interested in becoming public historians and doing museum work. And I wonder if you have any advice for students who are here in the room or listening to the live stream, who are advice on getting into museum work, <laughs> pursuing a career in that field. It's a commitment. Um, it's it's you know it has to be a love and it has to, it's it's almost a duty. Um, you know, museums are responsible for telling stories, um, and the the materials, the the documents, the objects or belongings um, have and can reveal uh, incredible stories. Um, and those in museums are the stewards of those stories. Um, so it's an exciting opportunity um, to pursue um, connections uh, with communities. Um, you know, I think the way the way I think about it, not more from a funder of museums now, is um, you know how how do we reimagine place making? Um, I think in, in Connecticut anyway, and in Rhode Island often enough to think about the, the things that we've lost touch with. Um, we, we rarely even understand or know what's in our own backyard, and yet those histories are so incredibly powerful and rich. Um, you know, I'm always thinking, um, along with my Native colleagues, about Indigenous space, you know, and a lot of people are asking questions about Indigenous histories and how do we re-Indigenize these spaces. You know, we don't have to go um, much further than looking at the name of a river or the name of a road that has a Narragansett name or Nahantic name um, or Pequot name. Um, and every one of those names is a story. Um, you know, and I think it's our responsibility in uh, whether it's academics or in the museum uh, arena um, to, to help animate those stories and connect um, the broader public to those, um, especially since many of them have been hidden uh, or deliberately erased. Um, I didn't really talk about um, what, it, you know, among the Narragansett community is considered pencil genocide, the systematic relabeling of uh, people's races um, to make them not Indian, anything other than Indian, because the term Indian ascribes with it uh, certain power and rights. Um, and when that doesn't 
uh, transmit into a document, those power and writes don't transmit as well. Um, sorry, I went off a little script there, but um, you know, just thinking about how revealing that can be um, for for any community um, in any institution. Um, talking about that, um, you know, the social history, um, and they're all of our stories, um, but it's an opportunity to connect. And I'm probably not the best person to answer that question because I really fell into museum work in 2017. Um, that's when I left teaching and became a museum curator. And I will tell you, I had absolutely no experience working in a museum whatsoever. But what the person who hired me, who also, who also turned out to be the same person that brought me from the Whaling Museum to Mystic Seaport, what she said when she hired me is, we can teach you all the things we need to teach you about being a curator, but you've got the perspective we want for our storytelling, right? Because it's all about storytelling. So I think that perspective, that ability to engage with community, that ability to tell stories, um, at least in, in my situation, was more important than having a museum studies degree. You, you might actually be in the presence of the two most accidental museum people <laughs> in the world. We're supposed to be out with shovels, yeah. digging trenches, and we're museum folks. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And thank you all for coming. I hope you all will consider um, coming back on November 2nd when our series returns with a presentation by artist Jeffrey New Warren on recreating Providence's historic Chinatown.